Great. All right, everyone. Well, welcome. This is uh, the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara's event in collaboration, the, Muse the murals of Santa Barbara. I'm going to be joined by uh, Julia Campos and Rachel Heidendry, and we're going to jump into some murals here in Santa Barbara. But first of all, my name is uh, Sarah Dildine. I am our exhibitions manager here at Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara. For those of you that don't know me, um, I've been here for six years. I also am the director of our Emerging Leaders in the Arts program, or ELA as we call it in-house. Uh, that program is for individuals from underrepresented racial backgrounds that are interested in art museum leadership. It's a program that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, we've had three years and we usually host between three and seven ELA fellows that are interested in arts museum uh, work and leadership. We usually provide curatorial training, professional development training, individual mentorship, uh, and then they also work on a annual uh, program throughout the year that the museum supports. Um, if you're interested in that program, please check out our website. There's a ton of information on there about ELA um, and feel free to reach out if you wanna get involved with that program in future iterations. So today uh, we're gonna be jumping into murals within Santa Barbara, as I mentioned. Soon Julia will be uh, providing us with a historical context of a few mural movements before we hear from Rachel Heidendry about two specific murals located in Santa Barbara. I will give a disclaimer that we're not gonna be talking about street art today. Uh, we're gonna be talking about um, a few of the murals within Santa Barbara that the Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara is connected to and has been involved with. Um, and this is not a comprehensive review of all murals within Santa Barbara. We would like to bring awareness to and continue this conversation around our town's murals. So this will be a glimpse into the bigger picture here and I encourage everyone to continue learning about these murals. Um, I've had such a blast digging into the murals here and some Santa Barbara history. So I hope that this can continue your journey as you uh, learn about murals around. So um, I will go through a couple of these slides that I have for you. Um, this talk uh, originated following our, our uh, 2021 Earth Day mural that we were partnering with with the Community Environmental Council, Paseo Nuevo, and B-Cycle and the Arts Fund. This was in April 2021. This um, was, was released and open to the public for uh, Earth Day of, of this year. And um, throughout creating this mural, it was just such a wonderful experience to, to bring community together, to work with artists in town and talk about what that means to bring more art, public art for uh, the Santa Barbara community. So because of that, a whole bunch of conversations started between myself and Rachel and Julia Campos as well, along with other members of the staff and com community members as well to create some information for the public around the murals of Santa Barbara. This is a mini little map. Um, I wanted to give uh, a quick note that we will soon be um, placing a map of murals in Santa Barbara on our website for people to access. It will most likely be a link to a Google map that will allow you to go through and check on a few of the Santa Barbara murals in town. This one right here is the Earth Day mural that we had completed this April. I'm gonna go over some of the other numbered dots that you see here. And again, this is not a comprehensive list of all of murals in town. This is just going over a couple of the murals that you can see. These are um, all downtown here, but there's, there's a couple outside. And this will continue to grow as uh, we continue to build this map. So that will be accessible within the next couple of months for you all. A couple of other murals that I just wanted to dig into before we have some historical context around mural movements by, uh, by Julia Campos are some murals that have come up recently. And then I'll also mention just a few murals that um, we'll continue to dig into. But these uh, two murals uh, were, are more recent. These are from 2020 that were inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement. You may have seen these around. These are both um, on Haley Street. The one on the left by Danny Meza is on Haley and De La Vina, and the one on the right is on um, Anna Kappa and Haley. And these two um, were two murals that were brought um, to the Santa Barbara community out of urgency. This was something that was painted. I think one of these was painted within 24 hours. I think that was Danny Meza's. Uh, these are two murals that um, you can still see, and um, I highly recommend you check them out. Um, also, um, right now, I wanted to give a quick mention about the Ortega Park murals. These murals, there's a lot of conversation going on out uh, around right now. So if you're familiar with um, 
the city council meetings and what's been going on and, and the, the artists that have been involved. There's a lot of conversation about renovation for this park. Uh, we're not gonna dig in too much about everything that's going on right now, but I did wanna mention this and include this because I know Julia Campos will be mentioning this shortly for her um, movement, mur mural movement conversation. Uh, some of these murals uh, started in 1979 with Manuel Unzueta. And these are, there were several artists involved. There was 18 murals and um, I believe 10 or 11 are still, um, are still visible and still available for people to view. Uh, these have gone through several renovations over the past couple of years, um, since 1979 actually. So um, this is just a really interesting time in our community to be looking at um, public art and what's happening. So I will be sending a couple of links in the chat for you to do some of your own research for what's going on with Ortega Park murals. So you can follow along with that conversation that's going on right now, which is so interesting. Then there are two murals that Rachel Hayden will be digging into. So this is a mural that is by Alfredo Ramos Martinez that is currently in the uh, Santa Barbara Cemetery Chapel. Um, this is a fresco and she will be digging into the history of Ramos uh, Martinez. She'll also be talking about David Alfaro Siqueiros. Um, which is in the, this is a mural in front of uh, SBMA. And there's also a link to some materials for teachers that I'll be linking in the chat as well. But that brings me to our first speaker, which is Julia Campos. Julia Campos is a colleague of mine here at the Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara. She was born and raised in Santa Barbara, California, and she is attending SBCC where she studies art history and studio art Currently, she is working as the Museum and Visitor Services Coordinator here at Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara. She began her relationship with us in 2018 as a fellow in the Emerging Leaders in the Arts program that I earlier mentioned. While in ELA, Julia created a solo exhibition with Oakland-based artist Natalia Anciso titled El Corazon. El Corazon aimed to bring light to the struggles Latinos face in America as well as highlight the beauty of Latino culture and ever since I met her in ELA, I always swore that she was a born curator. I will say that every single time I mention her name, but she is um, a wonderful curator and a great colleague and a good friend of mine. After, uh, after Julia, we'll be hearing from Rachel Heidendry, who is an arts writer, educator, and curator specializing in modern and contemporary art of the United States and Latin America. She um, has had writing appear in publications, including Public Art Dialogue, Art 21 Magazine, The Architects Newspaper, Hypoallergic, and East of Borneo. She is currently the manager of docent and academic programs at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, where she curated the 2019 exhibition, Alfredo Ramos Martinez on Paper. Previously, she was the manager of public programs at the American Folk Art Museum in New York and a 2011 Fulbright Research Scholar in El Salvador, where she created the first archive for the study of Salvadorian mural painting. She holds an MA in Art History from the Institute of Fine Arts, NYU, and a BA in Art History from Bard College. I'm so, so, so excited to get this talk started. I've been uh, talking to Julia and Rachel about this, this conversation since the inception of the Earth Day mural, so I cannot wait to welcome Julia Campos. Um, she will be sharing her screen, so I'll stop sharing mine. And um, again, if you have questions, please place them in the chat and um, we can continue to go. And uh, Julia, I believe you are muted, so I'll have you unmute. All right, um, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, like you said, I'm Julia Campos. Um, I'm going to be giving a brief um, overview of the Mexican Revolution and the Mexican mural movement um, to lead into the Chicano movement and mural movement. And then we'll talk about how the Chicano movement movement presented itself in Santa Barbara and the murals that um, came out of that. So the Mexican Revolution began in 1917 and in 1920 the new government of Partido Revolucionario Institucional was established. Um, that same year the government commissioned a large amount of public artworks and the themes for these artworks centered around uh, glorifying the Mexican Revolution, um, Mexico's pre-Hispanic past, and promoting the ideals of this new government. 
They also served as a way to communicate with the common people, to inform and spread visual messages to uh, their population that was largely illiterate. Um, they portrayed the ideology of the worker and the middle class re revolution. Uh, Diego Rivera, Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, and David Alfaro Siqueiros are the most famous and influential to come out of the Mexican muralist movement and collectively are known as Los Tres Grandes or the Big Three. And the images and iconography that were created during the Mexican movement and their um, innovations would come to influence the Chicano movement and the Chicano mural movement. Oh, okay. So Diego Rivera, he is one of the most famous of Los Tres Grandes. Um, this mural here uh, at the Rockefeller Center is one of his most iconic and controversial pieces. Uh, Rivera was um, influenced by European modernism and he incorporated elements of cubism into his work. Um, Paired with bright colors, he was wanting to depict the working class people as a noble and glorious. Here we have Jose Clemente Orozco. He served in the Mexican Revolution himself, and many of his themes revolve around um, the, suff uh, the horrors of war and the suffering of mankind. Um, he was also inspired by European modernism namely expressionism. He had a lot of um, loose brushwork and uh, distorted forms that is shown within that um, period. And then David Alfaro Siqueiros, he was the youngest of Los Tres Grandes. Um, he used progressive materials and techniques in his work um, using images of science and technology to portray progress. This paint, this mural here, America Tropical, um, was one of three he painted within the United States. Um, another one being um, the mural that Rachel will be talking about. Um, this one was whitewashed six months after it was painted because of its politically charged message. Um, but starting in 1988, the Getty Institute, along with um, El Pueblo de los the Los Angeles Historical Monument uh, worked to uh, conserve the mural. And in 2012, it was reopened to the public. So El Movimiento, I want to highlight this quote here from Signs of the Heart, uh, California Chicano Murals. Um, Truly public art provides society with the symbolic representation of collective beliefs, as well as continuing reaffirmation of the collective sense of self. So I think it's super important, this quote um, sort of aligns with the ideas of the Mexican mural movement and the Chicano mural movement. Murals really served as a way to communicate with a community and reaffirm uh, identity within them. So El Movimiento emerged in the late 1960s and fought for civil rights and so, uh, social justice. It has its origins in East Los Angeles, specifically with the uh, Los Angeles blowouts that took place. Um, about 15,000 students walked out of their classroom to um, protest inequality within their school system. So some examples of that were um, Chicano students were not allowed to speak Spanish and they were often pushed into vocational training. Um, so the Chicano mural movement arose um, parallel to that, uh, just as is shown with the Mexican Revolution. Um, and it was an important organizing tool for them, as well as a means to reclaim their cultural heritage. So it fought against the idea of a single idea of beauty and order. Um, unlike with the Mexican muralist movement where murals were um, supported and funded by the government. In the Chicano mural movement, murals were made on the walls of barrios in East Los Angeles. So 
it was really grassroots and within the community and less government um, funded until later in the movement. Uh, hey Julia, I, I love that you're bringing that quote up. Um, and I think especially to when we're considering community and we hear this word community a lot. I've heard it um, talked about a lot with um, like Ortega Park murals and um, with some other murals that are around too. I just, I just wanted to make a note that I think it's great to also mention giving community a functional meaning of a group of people who share a sense of community or who share common interests and values and a sense of solidarity. So I just loved that point that you bring up with that quote on the previous slide. Um, and I think it was just so meaningful to bring up and is so um, important for our Santa Barbara community today when we're thinking about murals. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the Chicano movement was really for that with their murals. They really were thinking about this idea of the rights of the community to decide what art they have there. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna show just a few slides of some murals from the Chicano mural movement and some artists. So this one, Instant Murals by Osco, which comprised of Willie Heron, Patsy Valdez, Harry Gamboa, and Gronk. And then we have the Del Rey mural by Antonio Bernal. So this one is um, one of the earliest Chicano uh, murals recorded. And it was, about the events and people that inspired and affected the uh, El Movimiento, the Chicano movement. So some notable figures in there are Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Sosa Chavez, and figures from the Mexican Revolution. This is amazing. I, I love that as well because I also think of the, um, the wall of respect that was occurring in Chicago around the, the 1970s as well, which is the black community there in Chicago. So I'm loving, um, I love just that tie in there as well. And I think, uh, again, just thinking about the murals that we have here in Santa Barbara, it's so great to hear about uh, the thorough lines that you can find. All right, and then this mural, No Compre Vinagayo, um, was in solidarity with the United Farm Workers Movement and the great boycott that was going on at that time. And then we have We Are Not a Minority by Congreso de Artistas Chicanos Atzlan. Oh, I skipped one. And so this one, The Great Wall of Los Angeles by Judith Baca, was made near, nearing the end of the Chicano movement in 1976. And it goes over the um, history of ethnic peoples in California. Um, it is one of the longest murals in the world. It stretches over half a mile. Um, yeah. So then we'll move into El Movimiento in Santa Barbara. So Manuel Onsueta was a huge figure within El Movimiento in Santa Barbara specifically. Um, he provided a lot of the inspiration and leadership for murals here. He taught mural classes at um, UCSB for a number of years and currently teaches at uh, Santa Barbara City College in the Chicano Studies Department. Um, so a lot of um, Manuel and Suata's early projects centered around Casa de la Raza. Um, which is a Chicano community center founded in 1970s, in the 19, in 1970, uh, originally called the Chicano Positive Movement. Um, he began his murals inside Casa de la Raza in 1971. So here we have the new spirit by Manuel Nzueta, um, which he says is an intention to portray his um, or the reality of the Chicano movement. And then here we have two murals. This one on the left is to the Mexican song. And this one on the right, I could not confirm a name for. I do believe it could be allegory to brotherhood, but I'm not sure. And then, oh, did I skip one? Yes, I did. Um, and then we have a book's memory, which is a personal expression of Unsuata's views on education and knowledge. And then I have one more image from Casa de la Raza. I couldn't confirm a name on this one either, um, but I'd like to note sort of the Mexican flag colors in the wing 
Um, again, going back to that idea of community and a collective sense of self, which we saw in both the Mexican Real Movement and the Chicano Movement. And then we have the Ortega Park murals of 1979. Um, so like Sarah said, this there's 18 murals made in the park um, by local artists and community volunteers. Um, the themes of the, these murals range from cosmic unity to the Aztec era. This one pictured here is Manuel and Suetas. And then we have... I think too a great a really important thing to note um, with Manuel Unzueta who is who is still extremely active and I think with the Ortega Park murals right now he is um, he is having a lot of conversations with some groups around around these murals um, but one amazing thing that um, Manuel Unzueta was doing um, and has been doing is uh, working with the SB Arts Alliance and just working with uh, youth in in Santa Barbara in general and the the SB Arts Alliance is an incredible program that is um, that is organized by the Santa Barbara City uh, the Parks and Recreation Department, and they bring they bring youth from 14 to 21, and um, it's it's specifically to help um, avoid youth on youth violence. Um, but they're really amazing. They they um, work with art projects around town, and I think another large name with with uh, associated with the SBAA is Danny Mesa, who is, also has several murals around town. Um, so I just, I definitely want to state that with Manuel Unzueta, who has just been um, connected with the Mexican muralist movement um, in the 70s in Santa Barbara and um, continues to do some, some great work today with, with youth. Absolutely. And then here's another mural from Ortega Park. So again, we see that solidarity with the United Fine Workers Movement. And then this last mural that I'll be showing, um, what I see here with this mural is if we go back to the Mexican muralist movement in the 1920s um, and Diego Rivera's intention to show workers as uh, noble and glorious, we see that here within the Chicano movement, still a way to show um, respect to um, the common people and workers. Um, Manuel Unzueta also has um, murals at the Eastside Library on SBCC campus. Um, as well as um, the Franklin Center, Santa Barbara Junior High School, and Bonnet Park. And I'm sure there's others that I don't know about, but yeah. He has had so many murals around town. It's so amazing to see. And um, I mean, he's even repainted some of these murals at Ortega Park. Um, I'm just putting in the chat right now, if you're interested in learning um, and really digging into what's going on right now with the Ortega Park murals, um, the city has put out a, um, and actually I think there's um, some, the condition of the current artworks as well is, is in this, this link that I just sent, but it's an evaluation of these murals. And it kind of goes over the plans for renovation for this park. Um, but I believe one of one of the options would be that uh, Manuel Unzueta would, would paint um, potentially some new murals there. So um, there's just a lot going on with murals. Um, and in Santa Barbara uh, today, I think it's just definitely worth noting and definitely worth checking out that evaluation. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Julia, for going through those. Um, if you can unshare your screen, I'm going to invite Rachel to come back uh, and join. Hi, everyone. Okay, I'm going to spotlight you. Uh, let's see. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel, for joining us. Um, I'll let you kind of dig in here. But um, again, just as a, a regroup from uh, Julia's talk, I really wanted to make sure that uh, when we dig into these and we're considering, we're considering Santa Barbara murals, we're understanding, you know, the time frame, but also the different movements that are interacting with murals and the importance of having such amazing murals here in Santa Barbara. So I'd love for Rachel to dig into these too. Um, I, I'm just so happy that we have Rachel here in Santa Barbara with us uh, and just her expansive knowledge, or at least to me, I think your knowledge is incredible when it comes to its murals. And I, I always turn to you with questions. Um, but thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to hear about the murals that you're gonna be digging into. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for organizing this discussion and um, Julia for that wonderful presentation. As Sarah said, I'm gonna be talking primarily about this mural cycle in the Santa Barbara Cemetery Chapel by Alfredo Ramos Martinez. And then at the end, I'm gonna bring in the Siqueiros mural and talk about those two together. 
So I wanted to just briefly mention kind of in thinking about the Mexican mural movement, we have this narrative of Los Tres Grandes that is very much how we kind of learn and think about those, the, the mural movement because those were the artists that certainly received the most commissions. Um, but there were so many other artists that were a part of that movement and really a part of Mexican modernism as a whole. And one of those artists was Alfredo Ramos Martinez. And if we were to really situate him within the kind of narrative of Mexican modernism, I think we'd find him most strongly within the context of arts education in Mexico. He was the former director of the San Carlos Academy, which was the first art school in all of the Americas. And he was a teacher to so many of the artists that are now sort of household names, someone like David Aparo Siqueiros. When we think of Ramos Martinez's style, and it's really his later work that we're looking at, he really embraced the ideals of Mexicanidad, which was a, a movement of really embracing imagery associated with the indigenous peoples of Mexico. It was a moment in which they were hoping to form a national identity that was no longer rooted in sort of European and kind of colonialist ideas and really looking at what was the heart and the root of Mexican identity. Um, and so you see in his art forms, whether it's murals or, or drawings, um, this reference back to um, traditional crafts or um, the indigenous peoples that he would encounter. Um, he's also someone when you think stylistically, we think about him as someone who had this architectural style to his work. He was really a master of kind of filling space and composing um, a plane, whether working on, on newspaper or, or on a fresco uh, mural. His palette is also almost always these neutral tones of siennas and ochres, and then populated by these pops of color. So moving um, to how he gets to Santa Barbara, in 1929, he moves to Southern California with his family. This is him and his wife, Maria, and their daughter. And he starts receiving commissions in Los Angeles and um, also exhibiting his work. And it's through those that will bring him up to Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is having its own sort of cultural moment at this period of time. In 1930, the Faulkner Gallery opens at the Central Library. And in 1934, Ramos Martinez is invited to have a solo exhibition there. And it's through that exhibition that he really meets some influential people in the community. And he is, um, is really introduced to the community at large. The people who would commission the mural at the cemetery chapel are Mary Smith, who you see in this newspaper clipping, and then Henry Eichem, who was um, a really wonderful composer at the time. Mary Smith was the widow of George Washington Smith, who was a famed architect. He was someone who really established the Spanish colonial style in Santa Barbara. Um, and he had built this chapel along with help by Luda Marie Briggs in um, 1926, they finished the construction. And you can see a photo of the outside of the chapel here. So Eichem and, and Smith invited Ramos Martinez to create a mural cycle in the interior of this chapel. And we're gonna kind of walk through this together. Um, it's really important when you think about this mural to think about the function of this space and also the way he has composed the mural is really meant to mimic how people would walk within it. So the first image that really strikes you is this central panel here of the Christ figure. And he's made the Christ figure with his hands kind of outstretched, blessing over all of those people who would be gathered in this space. He's elongated the fingers, elongated sort of all of the, all of the figures in the mural cycle which is characteristic of, of Ramos Martinez. And I think within this context also speaks to sort of the reaching toward heaven that would be important given the context. And the other important note is that if the chapel was being used for a service, you would often have a body, you know, in the casket kind of presented here on the altar. And so the blessing would also be over, over that um, person. One other detail is this garland of flowers that you see wrapping around and throughout the whole series. And the main flower he includes is the Easter lily, which is the symbol of the resurrection, which ultimately is, is the theme of this mural. 
Now, as you would move up, so if you were to walk up the aisle, sort of pay your respects and then walk around, you would then see the murals on this back wall. And that mural, I think, is the most striking and, and one of the most important ones in this cycle. He has chosen to create this panel that he called Suffering Humanity, and it's um, including Indigenous Mexicans with their hands over their faces, um, kind of grieving all of humanity. And I think it's such a powerful image when we have the Christ figure before it kind of blessing over. And then in the juxtaposition here, he's having the hands over the face in contrast. And then as you would then walk out, so you kind of walk through the doors, you are processing out and you have these figures processing alongside you. And I put those two together. So he described this as a procession of monks nuns and women of all nations. You see the monks and the nuns in this bottle panel. And then you have the women of all nations here. So it's including, including sort of Anglo depictions of women as well as indigenous women from Mexico who would be all offering flowers and walking toward the back panel, which is of the risen Christ, his arms now open to receive everyone um, and the angels sort of bowing down before him. I think we think about this mural cycle, it doesn't for us in 2021 necessarily feel that radical, but at the time it's really this significant break away from sort of traditional representations that you would see in a Judeo-Christian religious space, um, both in its inclusivity and also in its style. Um, and I think it's important to note that Ramos Martinez was a very deeply religious man. A lot of his themes and throughout his artwork and in his murals um, are religious subjects, but he brings um, his modern approach to those. So he finishes the mural in 1935 and he stays in Santa Barbara for another year. Um, and he does a few murals in private homes around Santa Barbara, including at the Eichmann House, um, which still exists to this day. And I think one, one thing to kind of note about the mural is, you know, it was completed in 1935. It's almost been here nearly 100 years at this point. And yet it's still a mural that a lot of people in Santa Barbara don't necessarily know about. And I think part of that is by nature of that it is in this interior space and kind of in this religious context even though the chapel is non-denominational. Um, and I think also for those who do know about it, it's incredibly beloved. Um, there was some discussion after the mural was originally painted from those on the cemetery board who wanted the mural removed and who were trying to get it removed. But anytime the community caught wind of it, they put a stop to it and the, and the mural has remained and is in really impeccable condition. So in contrast to Ramos Martinez's mural, Portrait of Mexico Today by David Faro Siqueiros was not originally made in Los Angeles. As Julia noted, it was one of three murals he created while he was living there in 1932. It's the only one to survive fully intact, really because of the fact that it was created in a private home. And um, the mural is, the title really kind of sums it up. It's his reflection of the, the of Mexico in that moment. And in the central panel, what he has painted are these three figures. You see two indigenous women wearing traditional rebosos who are really meeting you at eye level, the way he's painted them. And in between them is this child whose eyes are painted with kind of hollowed out. And for Siqueiros, this was a symbol of the country's um, rural suffering poor. He has placed them on this stepped pyramid, which is reminiscent of Mesoamerican architecture. And so I think with this kind of just with these figures, you're looking at this really interesting interplay between this past, the present, and the future of Mexico, the, the future kind of being symbolized by the child. To the left, you then have this other grouping of, of figures. Here on the right, you have um, President Calles, the president of Mexico at the time. He's wearing revolutionary garb with a mask falling off of his face, money bags at his feet. Between them, you have these two kind of martyrs to the revolution that feel like they're floating in space, the, this sort of cloak of communism wrapped around them. And then here you have 
this framed portrait of JP Morgan. And so for Ramos or for Siqueiros rather, this is really a anti-capitalist critique of the Calle's presidency. He very much felt that Calle's was um, corrupted by greed. That's why you have the money bags and he was sort of this traitor to the revolution that he felt, um, which is the mask kind of falling off of the face. So it's his sort of you know, reflection on the influence of the United States on Mexican politics and the economy in that period of time. The final detail you get in this mural is his sort of inclusion in, in the corner of a Russian soldier kind of kneeling down ready. And so he's linking here, Siquiros, the Russian and the Mexican revolutions. And I think also kind of for him sort of um, putting a little teaser of the revolution that he still hopes will take place in Mexico. Um, so the mural was moved to Santa Barbara. It's on the front steps of the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. This was after a very long and lengthy process of research and consultations with art historians and conservators and, and artists of whether Santa Barbara was the right place to, to keep this mural. Um, which ultimately it was decided it was. And it quite literally was um, transported to the museum and installed on the front steps in the early 2000s and then unveiled to the public in 2002. In closing, I just want to talk about the relationship between these two murals and, and really just mention how absolutely kind of extraordinary it is that Santa Barbara has these two murals by um, these famed Mexican modernists. Um, and I think interestingly too, this relationship between the professor and then the student, right? The, the ability that we have as for those of us who live here um, to be able to look at both of these murals in a single day and look at the similarities and differences, the way that they approach figuration, the way that they play with the architectural space, the way that they're bringing in indigenous themes, um, and also their, their commentary on um, the times in which that they live. I think it also speaks to the huge influence of Mexican modernism on South, Southern California specifically and the Americas even more broadly. And I think that's what Julia so wonderfully talked about with the movimiento. Um, and I think for both of them, if, if Siqueiros is really rethinking um, or if he's really kind of addressing social concerns in this political moment in 1932 in Ramos Martinez, what you're, you're seeing is this rethinking of tradition that is, I think, a really powerful um, way of approaching um, a mural. So thank you so much. And I hope that everyone, if you haven't seen these murals, you go and see them. The cemetery mural is available to view during public hours. Um, so it's the, if the doors are open, you can walk in and, and enjoy it. Thank you so much, Rachel. I, I really enjoy hearing about those murals. And um, here, I'm going to spotlight us back again. Um, and Julia, I'm also going to bring you back in and spotlight you if you want to start your video. Um, but I also highly encourage you to see to see those murals. Um, it's so amazing, like Rachel says, that we that we have them and we have access to them. Um, I was able to see the um, the mural in the cemetery chapel. Uh, during COVID times, I had to schedule a time. So it might be a little bit difficult, um, might be more open now, I think, as Rachel mentioned, with public hours. Um, but I, I definitely encourage you to go see it. Um, once you're in the space, it's just, you, it just, it feels so different and it's very warm and receptive. Um, and uh, I agree, whenever, when you're in the center and you're seeing the indigenous populations you know, with their hands over their face, um, it kind of just pulls your heart. So it's just really beautiful to go see and also just the technique that they use. But um, I would love to start, um, I mean, the, the uh, thank you both for digging into the historical background of mural movements and also these two murals here. Um, I do wanna also bring back in some of the more recent murals and um, I would love, so Rachel, you, the two that you had, had brought up are both frescoes and I'm hoping that you can describe a little note about what a fresco is and maybe how that is uh, different to the techniques of uh, more recent murals like the Earth Day mural that we just did or um, the mural in the, um, let's see, I mean, the Sojourner's mural on uh, Haley as well, I guess Harper, there's, there's so many in town, but can you describe that? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really important point. Um, 
the fresco technique is that the artist would be painting with a water-based paint on wet plaster. So then when the, the plaster dries, the pigments of the paint are kind of embedded within the wall, right? So if you want to get rid of the fresco, you have to chip it off. Um, so Ramos Martinez did a traditional fresco technique, whereas Siqueiros, who was always the experimenter, actually created his with fresco on cement, um, which was not as successful. It, it, it survived, it works, um, but it means that the pigments are actually resting on the surface. So the conservation efforts for that mural are um, much more intensive because of that technique or that experiment of technique. Um, and in contrast, you know, this is before we're looking at the 1930s, so it's before the development of acrylic paints, um, which is when you think about the community mural movement, um, usually those are going to be painted with industrial paints and, you know, things that you can go to the hardware store and, and purchase. Of course, there have been tremendous innovation in, uh, in paint as well, um, especially ones that have um, kind of... Uh, protection within it against um, uh, like sunlight and things like that. But I think those, the, the difference in, in knowing the way that those are made um, is important as we think about the legacy of mural painting. Definitely, yeah. And Julia, I'm curious too, if you had saw anything uh, related to the techniques that were being completed through the Mexican uh, mural movement. But I just, I, I think it's so amazing to think about, again, these, these techniques and the fact that the Siqueiros mural was brought here. I mean, just the whole process of bringing it in a huge truck. I mean, I just, uh, being an exhibitions manager, being someone who works in logistics, I would love to have just seen that happen. And if anyone's in the San Francisco area anytime soon, I know that there's a Diego Rivera uh, work that is, um, that is being installed currently and they're doing some conservation work, but they're always just so uh, difficult to move when, when they're fresco. So that's yeah, pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, Julia, did you, did, was there anything in technique that you, that you found, I guess, related to frescoes and or these more temporary works that, um, that you bring note to? Because I think um, were a majority of those paintings um, uh, not frescoes, were they painted on these walls? Yeah, so within the Chicano mural movement, there wasn't, it was mostly just paint on walls and not something as um, more involved as um, creating a fresco. Um, and I think that kind of has to do more with this, um, idea of community. They wanted something that was, um, able for not people in the community that weren't artists, but wanted to help out. So something where they could be guided by an artist and create it. So they, something like that would have been a little, um, little more involved and, um, maybe more expensive as well. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And also just Kimberly, I see your note there about the, the murals that we had at Hotel Indigo. And I think, you know, Julia, as you're bringing this up with, with involving the community and these temporary, more, more temporary, I should say, because of the, the actual process of placing the murals there. But um, I remember when I first started here, um, they were painting a mural with Uni Min at Hotel Indigo here in Santa Barbara. And that was something where we had so many interns and, and involvement from the community to be able to paint that. Um, and I just thought that was such a lovely um, cycle that we would do. Every year we would have a new, a new mural on this huge wall of Hotel Indigo facing the, uh, the ocean. Um, but also, Julia, as you're speaking, um, I also just think, you know, this, this idea of, uh, you mentioned, I think, early on in your talk that it was a way in which they were providing information. So with the Chicano movement, the, the Mexican mural movement, it's getting the word out there. And I think that's something also really interesting to know with murals is, first of all, of course, that it's providing that information, it's creating dialogue within the community. Um, but I'm just, I, I think that's also a really wonderful point with that being temporary um, and how you're able to get like another, another transfer of, of information there. Um, and that also just continuing to lead, I mean, thinking about the more recent murals. So again, the, the murals that came out of the Black Lives Matter movement, the Earth Day mural that we placed here with Adriana Arriaga and Claudia Bortiga. Um, so I'm curious, Rachel, you also brought up ways in which the Santa Barbara community has been involved with murals and the ways in which they're involved. So you mentioned with Ramos uh, Martinez, how uh, the community really fought to, to ensure that we kept that mural here. Which I, I am so happy that that was the case. I'm glad that the community really backed that mural. 
and the content there. And also with the Sikeros, I'm curious if you could talk a little, like a, a very short snippet about that celebration. But I just think um, the ways in which the Santa Barbara community works in the past are pretty similar to how it's working now. I mean, I think the ways in which people are really responding to public art is, is really important. So how was that celebration with Sikeros? Yeah, I what I've heard about it um, is that it was this grand sort of unveiling. There were lines around the, you know, waiting to get in on State Street. And there was a large community celebration in which they had live music and the museum was open and they had a concurrent exhibition dedicated to Siqueiros and, and other works. Um, and it was really this um, kind of outpouring of interest and really celebration that this mural um, was coming to Santa Barbara. I was looking actually this this um, morning at a newspaper clipping from the period of time and they were interviewing different muralists about sort of the muralist coming, what does this mean? And it was um, in the article, they're talking about sort of the legacy of murals in Santa Barbara. And I think it's something that seems like almost every decade that kind of comes up as a new mural is, is perhaps created or introduced um, and sort of re-evaluating this incredible legacy that we do have in Santa Barbara. I think stemming back to, to Ramos Martinez's mural and, and I think other ones as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you, Rachel. I, I love that point you bring up too about how kind of every, nearly every decade we kind of have this resurgence of murals that, that we've had here, of the history there. And I mean, I know that I saw Michael Mbale on the, on the talk and I know that the work that you did with the Alakama Theater, I may have mispronounced that, but um, just ensuring that that work was also preserved uh, within the Presidio uh, is also amazing. Um, but I, I just love that that thought process. And you also mentioned, Rachel, within your talk of uh, this time period between the 20s and 30s in Santa Barbara, which was this, this huge push towards arts. Um, I know that that's when the Libera Theater was, uh, was reopened. Originally, it was this opera-focused um, uh, site, but then it was reopened in the 1920s, and the same with the Santa Barbara Bowl, which was originally the, um, the site of the end celebration for Fiesta, which is currently going on, that was in 1936. So it, this time frame um, between the 20s and 30s, I think is so interesting in Santa Barbara. And again, I encourage everyone to sort of dig, dig into that time frame. Um, and then Julia, as you spoke about the sort of 60s and 70s as well, it's kind of, again, these, these decades coming around and that brings me to my next question, my next point for you both. Um, thinking about the age of COVID, I think right now there's this huge push towards public art and what's what's physically available to people. Um, and so I'm curious too, you know, I think especially within with your experience and um, how you can maybe encourage the community to be involved in what's around uh, in this town. You know, what what does that mean in this age of COVID, specifically within Santa Barbara? Um, you know, I, I guess what, yeah, what has your experience been here and have you enjoyed the murals that are around? Right? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that growing up, it wasn't like, um, I didn't like search for these murals. I wasn't super aware of like, oh, all these are here. It was, um, um, if I'm driving around town and I see one, oh, there one is. But I do think that um, my uh, my mom is uh, involved in the arts and knows a little bit about the art in Santa Barbara. So I did grow up hearing about uh, the Ramos Martinez mural at the cemetery and um, the Siqueiros mural. So I do think um, that it's something that is readily available if you know that it's there. and historically public art and murals have been the most accessible form of art as um, museums and galleries sort of became this um, place that seemed like it was for a small group of educated or wealthy people. So I think um, anytime there's less of um, a way to communicate with the public, murals will always do that. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I think, you know, thinking about murals as, as public art and being accessible and this historical view of museums being this, you know, kind of maybe more for the elite. Um, you know, we've talked about that a lot in my the Emerging Leaders in the Arts program here. Um, and I think that's, I'm so glad that part of that conversation is changing, you know, that uh, museums are really having this push towards being more accessible. But I also love the idea of museums really ensuring that there's public art also available. So 
I think that's something that's, that is a great point of, of having that accessibility of driving around town, seeing something. And also, you know, making that point that Santa Barbara also has a very specific style, the Spanish style that's here. Um, so these, the, the adobe um, buildings with these red tile roof, um, it's something that a lot of tourists can tend to sort of take away. Um, but I, I think also too, you know, thinking about COVID um, and anything else, if you want to add Julia and or Rachel, but do you think that with uh, the new murals that have, that have been brought up, so the Black Lives Matter mural, our Earth Day mural, um, with, with these newer murals and also this conversation with Earth Park murals, is it something that you think is sparking because of COVID and it's some of the only art that's been accessible uh, for the, the community here? Or do you also think that there's just so much urgency behind the message of these murals um, or maybe a combination of both of those? I'm just curious what you both think. Yeah, I think, I think it is a combination. I think, you know, when I think about when um, this last year and a half with the pandemic, it was something I kept keeping my eye on of the amount of murals around the country that were being created. You know, you saw so many that were made, um, sort of these monumental pieces to honor essential workers, um, or you would see murals related to the political movements that were taking place last summer, especially the Black Lives, Ma Lives Matter movement. Um, and so I think that the, when we think about public art, right, public art is inherently connected to the public sphere, which if you think about from like a very formal definition is a place in which citizens engage in debate. You know, it's a place in which conversation takes, takes place. And so that acts out on public walls. And so um, I think in moments in which there is, um, whether it's political urgency or whether it's sort of a community building that so many people were feeling during the pandemic, I think that murals and public art is, is something that you see um, sort of popping up even even more, right? So I I think that that kind of outpouring or that um, intention to have a voice is something that you see, especially in those moments. And I think that that's what happened in Santa Barbara too. I think it also speaks to a growing arts community here and a growing um, arts community that is um, experimenting with styles and experimenting with, um, you know, different, um, ideas and, and different um, ways of making public art as well. So um, I think it's kind of a mixture of all of that coming together. Thanks, Rachel. I, I love I love what you said. I agree as well. And um, I mean, I think it, you know, I think it is a culmination of things, you know, and I think too, in, in being a part of the creation of the Earth Day mural um, and working with the, the Community Environmental Council, the CEC, um, you know, it's something that, of course, that, well, we as a museum really care about, um, just that, that conversation surrounding climate change and bringing awareness to that. So, um, and also, of course, with the Danny Mesa and um, uh, the other Black Lives Matter murals in town, it's just, it's important that those conversations are continuing. And um, I'm just so happy to see that the, the Santa Barbara city and community is receptive of those and continue those conversations. Um, I do want to open it up for questions. I'm noticing the time and we have only um, about five-ish minutes. So I'm curious if anyone has any questions. Um, and then I, as, as I wait, I'd love to just mention a couple of the other amazing murals that are around um, to check out. And again, I wanted to note that um, we'll be releasing this, this map, this accessible map where you can actually physically go on Google Maps and be able to see where you can access these. But um, there's still some, I mean, there's, there's so many amazing murals around town that um, I'm sure so many people know of and maybe have their favorites in parks and maybe hidden ones. There's some that I don't know of um, that I'm, I'm sure are you know, very akin to certain uh, neighborhoods. But uh, the courthouse mural is, is another one that I think uh, deserves a mention. Um, and that one is available in the Santa Barbara courthouse. And um, of course, when the, the courthouse is open, so I'm not actually sure if they're accessible at the moment, um, but I would just check their website to see when you could see that entire room, which I think is a 6,700 square foot mural around the space. Um, and also on the third floor, there is a clock mural, which is also really fun. You can just, as you're going up towards the, the clock tower, you can see that mural as well. Um, there's also murals in uh, several schools, and I know those were done by Danny Mesa and uh, Manuel Unzueta as well, excuse me, um, but some in Santa Barbara High School, the ones at SBCC that, uh, Julia, you mentioned earlier. Um, there's also some at the Santa Barbara Library, which is also a fresco, the Don Quixote mural. So there's just, there's so many murals, um, and of course we've had the murals with the museum, some temporary, some, um, some for, for longer periods of time. 
Um, but it's just such an amazing, um, amazing mural site here. And oh, I also don't want to forget to mention the Feng Song murals that were brought on with the Arts Fund. With I think every year they had um, given given this call for artists an opportunity for artists in town to to create another mural in the Funk Zone, which is just a, another area where you can go and see several several works. Um, but I will wrap up a couple of things. Thank you both so much, Rachel, Julia. I appreciate you so much for taking the time and working with me um, over the past couple of months. Thank you, Melinda. UCSB does have several murals as well. There's also several in, in Goleta. Uh, so this, I've been mentioning a ton in Santa Barbara City. There are tons, tons, tons um, across Santa Barbara County. And also I do wanna mention, I have a couple more links that I'll just put in the chat for you all. I did list um, the packet for David Alfaro Siqueiros that, um, that Rachel um, has had worked on for teachers. Um, but also there is this, um, there is a map, there's some more information for you guys about some more specific murals, about our mural, about the Santa Barbara Arts Alliance. I just wanna make sure that, again, this is not the starting or end point of this conversation for murals. It is merely a continuation. And again, I've had such a blast looking into these and the history of Santa Barbara. And I definitely encourage you all to continue your, your um, search and your understanding of, of the area that we live. Um, but I would again like to, to thank the panelists that have been here. Um, I'd also like to thank a lot of the interns that have helped with some of the information um, and the Santa Barbara Central Library. There is this amazing California and Santa Barbara case that uh, Jace Turner was able to help me with. Recommend to check it out. There's some really incredible titles in there really digging into the Santa Barbara history. Um, and for all of those who have painted murals, thank you so much for, uh, for continuing to make our Santa Barbara community a really beautiful one and continuing those, those conversations that are really important for us to have. Um, this will be available on YouTube as I previously mentioned and uh, we're, in, we're currently deinstalling our exhibition, Shauna Moulton. Um, thank you so much for, for being with us today for this conversation and um, please check out our website for more information on upcoming installations, upcoming exhibitions, events, the ELA program that I mentioned has a couple of events from the 2021 fellows. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much. And we will see you all soon. Thank you.